Hi, I'm Dr. Alfredo Carfinetti, Eiffel Science, Senior Science Writer. I'm here with Dr. Heather Sevier, uh, the Senior Property um, Curator <laughs> of Stonehenge. Uh, and what an honor that we are inside Stones. Can you tell us a little bit about what Stonehenge is? What we do know is nobody's living here. It's not associated with what we call a settlement in archaeology. It's definitely a ceremonial site. It's, it's somewhere special where people are coming together, made a huge effort to delineate this amazing space with these huge stones uh, as part of it. Uh, and we can assume it was equivalent of someone where they came for their spiritual lives, you know, perhaps to perform rituals. We know people are buried here. It is definitely a place of burial because there are 56 pits associated with the item bank and ditch at the whole cremation burials. Where does the name Stonehenge comes from? The Henge bit, I think, comes into medieval documents around about a thousand. They, they're circular sites that are defined by banks and ditches, but they're not um, meant to be defensive like the Great Iron Age hill forts. Some of them do have settlements where people were living. In fact, off to the northeast, um, there's an equivalent of a Neolithic village. Groups of houses were found through excavation. And then it was converted into a henge by a huge bank being put round that afterwards. It, it seems to be more to do with ceremony and gathering and communal activity. Something that obviously captures a lot of people's imagination is uh, the fact that uh, the alignment uh, with the solstice. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, Stonehenge is built on a solstice alignment, a solar alignment. And what happens is at mid, what we call midsummer, um, the sun rises in the northeastern horizon, comes up side of the heel stone, which is one of the stones that's a bit of an outlier, and shines right into the centre here and lands on a stone that we know is the altar stone. We don't know if it ever stood up like a modern altar. Conversely, then, at midwinter, if you stand in the centre, you could have watched the sun setting down to the southwestern horizon. And we think those people, it was probably more important because they would have known it was like the turning of the year and the days would get longer. But there also could be something to do with the moon, which is being investigated right now. We are in a lunar standstill, which apparently only happens every 18.6 years. It's all to do with measuring the cycle of the moon, I think I'm right in saying. I'm very aware I'm talking to a scientist. I think the moon in general would have been very important to them because, of course, it gives light, doesn't it? And, you know, when they had a full moon, perhaps they, they had extra light and they were able to do things that they couldn't the rest of the time. But in terms of the lunar sandstone, they think uh, it might have significance here because there are four outlying stones known as the station stones. Only two of them survive. And they form a rectangle. And there's some thought they might have been something to do with the setting out of the circle. Why do you think uh, the site has captured the imagination of so many people worldwide? Well, I think partly global tourism. It is known as an iconic site, but in terms of its uh, archaeology and everything, it was designated a World Heritage Site in 1986 because it is still unique in the world. And it's uh, also uh, with Avery, uh, which is other stone circles further north. Avery spectacular as well, and some of the stones are just as big, but it doesn't have the construction features that we have here. But then there are whole groups of people who feel spiritually drawn to Stonehenge. And uh, we have local Druid and pagan groups, and some of them really feel this is their place of worship.
could you tell us some of the more out there ideas about what Stonehenge could have been for? Well, we got a lot of talk about aliens. Some people think it's a computer. Some people think it's a calendar. Even some of our serious colleagues think it's a calendar. But other people are convinced they can see things on the stones. Uh, one woman has published saying it had to have a roof on it because it's in the south of England. Why wouldn't you put a roof on it? <laughs> and on a serious note, it, it does get a little bit frustrating because people almost don't want to read the science. But it's the modern world. There's a bit of a philosophical debate about whether we should allow modern academics in to excavate uh, the bits that have never been excavated. I mean, in some ways, it would be quite nice for a very targeted piece of excavation because there's so much science could then be applied to the results of that that they didn't have back in the 1960s. What have been the key archaeological discoveries that have informed our understanding of Stonehenge? Well, one of the problems is that the site itself has been about 50% excavated, but very little of it under modern conditions. But then um, there was what was called the Stonehenge Environs Project, and that looked at the surrounding area because Stonehenge doesn't just sit on its own. It's in a very complex landscape, which is one of the reasons it became a World Heritage Site. There are sites much earlier and sites much later. And then a consortium of universities also had what was known as the Stonehenge Riverside Project. And they, again, didn't do very much on the site itself, but looked at everything around. Because science has moved on so much, there's an awful lot that can be done these days without actually excavating. So we've got academics working on the geology of the stones, for example, trying to work out exactly where they came from. We've got scientists looking at um, animal bones and, uh, and pottery, material that's been excavated from Stonehenge previously, and, and setting it in its context of the surrounding landscape. What is some ongoing research that you're particularly excited about? <laughs> Well, I think it probably have to be the geology. There's a lot of geological research going on at the moment. There's the huge sarsen stones behind me. And sarsen is the old English word for silkrete. It's a form of sandstone. And those were marine sediments came from under the sea. But they uh, are found uh, on the surface of the landscape uh, in the Marlborough Downs, which is about 20 miles further north. So scientists have been here now with um, XRF machines. So looking at a chemical level, at the big stones and trying to find sources for them in the landscape. So that's quite exciting. And then there's, there's a smaller set of stones known as the blue stones, and they're almost more human-sized. It's been known for a long time that they probably came from the Priscilla Hills in West Wales, over 200 miles away. But there is still one mystery, and that's a single stone known as the altar stone. It's a piece of sandstone, and it sits almost in the middle, but on the solstice alignment. And at midsummer, the sun would have shone right in. And then, if you stand in the same spot at midwinter, you could watch the midwinter sunset going down. And the thought was that the people bringing the blue stones from further west in the Priscilla Hills might have picked up this one stone and brought it to Stonehenge. Well, the latest is that the geologists say it definitely didn't come from that bed. And they're looking at different sources, including in the north of England. Uh, top of Northern Ireland, Arran Island off Scotland. So the geologists are currently going around trying to source the altar stone, and that really will be quite exciting. How is Stonehenge still standing 5,000 years after it was built? There was a, a bank and a ditch cut first, so they delineated a space. And then we think a few generations, maybe a few hundred years later, the stone component of the monument comes in. And we think the first stones that came in were, were quite small, the blue stones, uh, and they were arranged in different configurations. But the huge upright sarsens, it's incredibly dense. Somehow they managed to apply what we would call carpentry techniques to this very dense stone. We find chipping areas over to the north where we think they dragged the stones and actually worked them. But what they managed to do was almost like carpentry techniques. They have tenons on the top of them and then the lintels have corresponding mortar holes which sit on those tenons and then the, the lintels themselves are toggled together almost like tongue and groove joints. And the whole thing is graduated to take in the lie of the land. So it's, it's together. In terms of it still surviving today, it did have a lot after the last campaign of excavations in the late 50s and early 1960s. 
there was a campaign of restoration, which we wouldn't do today. So about half the stones got bedded into concrete. And we do get regular engineering reports just to make sure they're not going to fall on all the millions of visitors who want to come and visit Stonehenge. <laughs> but in terms of their construction techniques, it's quite phenomenal, really. I think it's important that uh, um, we talk about the science and that, yes, there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, and But you also showed us uh, that there is uh, so much uh, excitement about not knowing and there is so uh, so many cool things that we might discover soon thanks to new techniques. Uh, so thank you very much for taking us on this uh, little tour of Stonehenge. Pleasure.